Well, it looks like we're live. I can tell that Mark is uh, still finish, finishing up his sermon on Mark 6 and Matthew 9. It's a very edifying message that he's providing us. In the meantime, while we're getting fired up here on our end, on our Q&A session, I was going to undertake to answer one a pending question that arose last week and a question that came in online. So the first point was a question related to Galatians 5.22, whether the fruit of the Spirit, and list them, are this, 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 uh, is that a singular or is it a you know, plural? And, and it is, in fact, singular. Karpos is singular. In fact, the next verb, estin, is also singular. So it would be literally correct to say the fruit is, and that singularity uh, is important. We see this particularly in Daniel 9.27. 77's is cut off. It's not 77's are determined or decreed, but is, a singular linking verb, meaning one single cut. So the same thing is true with the singular fruit of the Spirit. You know, some people have argued, well, deer, fish, these are words that are both singular and plural at the same time. And sometimes we'll even say, give me a bowl of fruit. Well, is, is it multiple fruits or what have you? But the point is that they all embrace a unity of the concept uh, in contrast to the works of darkness, which are uh, Galatians 5.22 pits the fruit of the Spirit against those. So, well and good. The question that came in online is a rather lengthy one. So we're going to read it as it stands. In the New Covenant, we no longer keep the shadows of God's law where Christ has fulfilled ceremonial requirements like animal sacrifice, worship at the Jerusalem Temple, and Levitical priests as mediators. Throughout church history, the orthodox doctrine for the New Covenant Church has been to discontinue celebrations of the feast days as specified in God's law, although we may observe some of the principles of the feast days. Do you know of a work that explains how the Old Covenant feast days have been fulfilled by Christ in the New Covenant? How did the feast days picture Christ to come? Sabbaths, new moons, Passover, unleavened bread, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. That's from a CT Bunker 1 uh, sent this request. So though we may not necessarily agree with every single element in the assertions that uh, he frames the question with, the question still is a valid one, uh, and it brings us into confrontation with several different uh, issues. One is the question of liberty uh, versus mandatory requirements. And that's where we get into the dicey part. It seems on the face of it that Paul is allowing some liberty for those who would uh, honor one day more than others. In other words, would acknowledge some of these uh, events as having uh, more important to him, that individual, than someone else who esteems all days alike. And in this instance, Paul seems to be asserting liberty. And it seems if that's the case, then liberty should be the method by which we approach the question. What happens in actual fact is that both sides try to bind the other. And liberty is the last thing on anyone's agenda, especially not the one that Paul seems to be asserting, which is unfortunate because the very passage in Galatians does talk about stand forth and liberty wherewith Christ sets you free. So to the extent that there is some kind of liberty established by Paul in the question of which days should we esteem and celebrate versus as I'm esteeming them all alike, uh, that becomes a, a problem in the Christian walk and reflects lack of maturity on our parts. And we're anxious to confess the sins of others and say, well, you need to be keeping these feasts or you need to stop keeping these feasts. So let's go into a little bit of these uh, feast issues because I think they're fascinating. If you look at... Uh, this is the final chapter of Zechariah, 14th chapter. And it says these are the uh, what will happen to Egypt if Egypt does not come up every uh, year uh, to observe this particular feast. Uh, let's go ahead and pull that out here. And, uh, let's see, it's verse 16, uh, Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth, not saying all the families of the earth, that means no one's exempted from going up unto Jerusalem, to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. The family of G Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that will not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. 
And then the passage concludes with uh, the discussion that all the world is holy at this point in time. In, the, in that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed therein. And in that day shall there be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Now we have to understand that Egypt is picked out specifically because in Isaiah 19, Egypt now is converted to uh, Christianity, to, the, to Jehovah worship. And it says the Egyptians will perform, uh, uh, swear an oath to, to Jehovah and perform it. So this simply is a conditional statement. It says if they don't keep their promises, these are the things that will happen. The Deuteronomic 28 uh, curses, withholding of rain, will occur. It's important to know that in Scripture, every single time that rain is said to be coming, it's almost in all cases God sends the rain. So we are to be grateful to God for sending the rain, the blessing of rain, gentle rain upon the mown grass, as it's phrased in places like Deuteronomy 32 or Psalm 72, a similar depiction of the messianic blessings. It is very rare when you get the passive sense, like a phrase like, it rains in Amos 4.7. That's almost unheard of that the scripture puts it in passive sense as if it just happened by itself. All the other examples are that God sends the rain. That was the mode of explaining it. So when God would, would withhold a blessing, it's because the people have uh, refused to accept the blessing that uh, uh, and the terms of the covenant that God has made with them. So here we have this requirement that all the families of the world need to be uh, coming before God every year. But it gets more interesting than that, because in the final chapter of Isaiah, look at verse uh, 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord God. So here it gets more interesting. Not only do you have to come every year on the Feast of Tabernacles, you must come every month on the new moon and every week on the Sabbath before the Lord to worship Him. So now all flesh is now required to be before the Lord worshiping Him. And this is actually a prediction that it will in fact come to pass, that all flesh comes up before. So under Jewish pressure, the Septuagint, the scholars that put the uh, took the... Hebrew of the Old Testament and put it into Greek, they decided to play fast and loose with this passage in Isaiah 66, verse 23. They had decided, let's add the word Jerusalem, that all flesh must come up to Jerusalem to worship God on every new moon and uh, every Sabbath. That is not in the original Hebrew. That is not what Isaiah said and what God gave Isaiah to say. The translators, having a very Zionist orientation, decided to modify the word of God and fix it to make it more pro-Zionist than it actually is. It never said they had to come up to Jerusalem in Isaiah. Uh, it simply is a false statement. Plus, we have a whole doctrine of the new Jerusalem laid out by Paul. Galatians 4, uh, Hebrews 12, you are come unto Mount Zion. Uh, the, and Jerusalem, of course, is term, termed the mother of us all. So there's a difference between the Jerusalem that now is it's in bondage, as Paul puts it, and the new Jerusalem that's above, uh, which is free. And the one that Scripture is talking about when it refers to all flesh coming up before into uh, to even a word of Jerusalem, it would be the new Jerusalem, uh, is every week and every month. Now, there's something very interesting about the Hebrew in this passage in Isaiah that I think we should take a brief look at before we close out this discussion. And I will then give a formal answer to the question posed by the, the uh, interrogator. It's this. Here's the literal, this is from um, J.A. Alexander's commentary. Here's the literal translation of that passage. And it's very interesting. From the sufficiency of new moon in its new moon, and from the sufficiency of Sabbath in its Sabbath, shall come all flesh to bow themselves before me, saith Jehovah. That's fascinating. It's, it's what he calls a slavish copy of the original Hebrew, because everyone has to try to figure out how to interpret it. But it's clear that the sufficiency of what's in the Sabbath and the sufficiency of what's in the new moon are fulfilled in this process of all flesh worshiping before God. Where they worship is specified elsewhere in Scripture, because Zion is now transnational. Look at Psalm 87, uh, Egypt and Babylon and Philistia and Tyre. Of course, you're all listed as uh, knowers of me, each and every man is born in Zion. So Zion is as large 
as the surface of the world. So these are all indications that God uses the pictures, the shadows, as this questioner put it, uh, to paint a picture for us of how the future will be shaped. The shape of the future, as seen from Old Testament eyes, will be that all flesh worships God uh, on a regular basis, weekly, monthly, annually. Uh, we seem to have covered all the bases between Zechariah 14 and uh, Isaiah 66. And, of course, we have the notion that it is not a lawless worship because if people will not be grateful to God, God will give them nothing to be grateful for, namely rain, uh, which fits the pattern because apart from anything else that's wrong with the guys in Romans 1 that God is repre uh, reprehending, he says, neither were they grateful. So to be grateful to God for what he sends is, is an important factor. I do not know of any works such as the interrogator asked uh, that speak to this question specifically. We certainly have very, um, what would I call them, tendentious works, works that are partisan on both sides. Those who say get rid of all the feast days, they're all gone. And those who say keep them all, they're all here to stay. Uh, and I think it's more true that the spirit of them is to remain. On premillennial grounds, which we don't hold to, I don't see how you get the entire population of the earth over to Jerusalem to do this every single week, every single month, and every single year. Yet that would be the requirement based on their reading of these scriptures. That's a lot of people in a small place, and they have to go back and do their work and come back. And there's travel issues, unless we have supersonic transit <laughs> and very large airport uh, to Tel Aviv and elsewhere uh, to handle the, all these people coming in and out. Uh, the disruption factor is immense, as opposed to the notion that the New Jerusalem is what's in view here, which makes the most biblical sense, especially when we consider how Paul closes out Galatians 4.31. Uh, he says, you know, the, the what saith the scripture, that the uh, son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free. He basically says that the literal Jerusalem corresponds to Hagar's son, and that the true Jerusalem corresponds to Sarah's, or Sarai's son. And that's interesting, because most folks who hold to a more of a dispensational viewpoint, they assume that the Jerusalem that is, is actually Sarah's son. But that's not what Paul says. Paul reverses, says no. It's the other way around entirely. The Jerusalem that now is actually corresponds to Hagar and is in bondage. And the Jerusalem that's above corresponds to the son of the free. And therefore, what saith the scripture? Ekbele exo. It says, cast out the son of the bondwoman. You shall not be heir with the son of the free. So the casting out of Jerusalem uh, apparently is a historical event that completed itself around 70 AD during the Vespasianic War when it was leveled and several million Jews were killed and the land was plowed under by salt by Rome and soldiers so nothing would grow there anymore for a long time. That was the casting out of Jerusalem, the son of the bondwoman, not the free. So I think that'll uh, get us started for today's session. Let's see if there's going to be any uh, open questions. I see we've had folks join us. Ford is here, Gordon, Roberto, Corral Jr., and of course uh, one of our uh, tech supporters is uh, keeping uh, a finger on the pulse of this live broadcast, because we do work without a net. Um, it was a very good trip I had to Australia. It was a really it was a, a wonderful thing to be able to minister on the other side of the equator, where uh, things are more right side up than you would think. Uh, here's a question. It is not a popular thing in most Christian circles to attribute things like Hurricane Harvey to the hand of God. Is it presumptuous to attest why God has sent such things to a particular area? Clearly, the book of Job makes it presumptuous to uh, draw hasty conclusions. Uh, the, Job's friends were very quick to draw conclusions based on what happened to Job. And said, it's clearly the hand of God. And, you know, who, who sinned that this man was born blind, him or his dad and his parents? So, so drawing conclusions can be very, very hasty. In fact, the other side draws conclusions too. Uh, they'll say, well, because we don't do such and so, this is the curse of God for Christians upholding um, Old Testament law. So fo both folks are throwing the same stones at each other. God obviously rules, uh, and his ways are much higher than our ways. So it's also presumptuous to assume 
at least in light of Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, uh, that we know his ways. You know, it says his ways are past finding out. So he has another purpose entirely. He might have in mind that there are aquifers to be filled out here. And we have a very dim view of catastrophe and death because our lives are but a vapor, and to us that's everything. But in the long God's eye view, uh, someone who is martyred at a young age is blessed because uh, they are with him, and their eternal uh, state is much more secure and blessed than they could have ever imagined down here. Paul makes the point of saying, I don't consider the uh, the things here, the temporary things, the trials and tribulations here, worthy to be compared to the exceeding weight of glory to come. And so there's an orientation here between the temporary, te uh, what I would call the provisional and probationary life on earth versus the eternal state in which we will ultimately enter. Uh, so we need to keep our mind on the eternal things at last, the things that are not subject to decay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'd be uh, cautious. Certainly God is the author of every single storm. His purpose in the storm is uh, less easy to determine. But, but the most, best we can say is the passage in Job uh, concerning heavy rain and things in this order, where it says, He sealeth the hand of man. And beasts head into their dens, and men are hiding their houses because... Man cannot continue his work due to the fact that the storm is blocking him. You know, it's impossible to work in 130 mile an hour wind. Uh, and consequently, the hand of man is sealed. We actually had an article about this in the Chalcedon Report, where I exposited a little bit further on this text out of Job, how God seals the hand of man, blocks man from doing what he thinks he's able to do, because we're very arrogant. We're going to go into the city and do this. And James says, no, if the Lord wills, you may go into the city and do this. God may seal your hand. And one of the ways that God seals man's hand is with weather, which is in his fist, and we can't control it, and we can't stop it. Let's see, there was something else that came back here. Let me back up here. Ah, uh, yes, thank you for sharing the video. And Kevin Amundsen asks, In respect to the Lord's Supper, Baptists generally use grape juice instead of wine. Can you identify the problems with this substitution? <laughs> or the vice versa substitution. This is one of those uh, churchly questions that, let me just, I'm going to be, I have to compromise a little bit here insofar as my personal practice comes into play. I don't drink alcohol whatsoever. However, I do uh, defend the Christian's right to consume it in moderation because I believe God created it to uh, make glad the heart of man, the countenance of man. So there's a so when I defend the alcohol in any way, shape, or form, it's not because I'm pr pr protecting my personal practice. I am not. Uh, whatever you want to say, I, I side with John the Baptist. I'm not going to touch the stuff. That's just my personal practice. That said, I think it makes sense if both were present, and the people in their own conscience would be able to make their own judgment, and then we should be charitable in regard to that. If you're going to force one or the other, I think that could be problematic, especially if they're going to force uh, grape juice only. And we know for a fact that this is usually done with an eye to trying to reroute what biblical wine tasted like and how much its alcohol content is. So we get all sorts of discussions about what it was like 2,000 years ago when, with vintners and the vint uh, that whole industry. Uh, and what Iwinophiles, wine lovers, would have to say about this, well, it's a zero content. So, so it, it's problematic to me because in the interest of um, preventing us from being wine bibbers and drunk, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think the converse is equally problematic if you're going to put only wine out there and someone is not going to drink wine. Uh, say he's a Nazarite, he's made an oath to God, and he's not going to consume it in all his days of his life. You're not going to offer any wine to John the Baptist in that case, or myself for that matter. So uh, I think the charitable approach makes more sense. To railroad one or the other is sad. And to consider the providing both, um, if you want to call it meat and milk at the same time, that's your prerogative. But to provide both and say that's a problem because you've, you've allowed people to sin in some respect or to dishonor God. Uh, I, it seems to me that that is equally problematic. Um, to judge others on a matter of meat or drink, and if it occurs at the Lord's Supper, which was a feast, it was a love feast to Jude, etc., I think that goes beyond Paul's warning not to be judging one another on these matters. So it seems to me the best route is to offer both. I do not pretend to be an expert on every church's practice. 
I simply can see that there are issues any time uh, an assistance is made on one or the other, and that we then at that point uh, puff up our spiritual pride and say, we do it right. Our communion has got the real deep, or I, our communion avoids drunkenness because we we don't uh, put the wine out there, we put the grape juice out there. Both of these are um, arrogant spiritual pride. But to say we honor uh, the Lord's Supper by giving the parents, the fathers, uh, the right to choose how they wish to uh, partake with their family to the extent the, the family would be participating at all, which is another debate, debate entirely, uh, to me makes the most sense and creates the most peace in God's house. And, and by the way, uh, it improves communion. If we're by communion, we're talking about its root meaning of community with one another. So the love feasts uh, should not be exclusive in that sense, that someone's going to be excluded either for or against the presence of alcohol. Again, I uh, have to preface this entire discussion with saying I don't consume alcohol. Uh, but that's a personal choice, and has nothing to do with any scriptural categories uh, other than my personal choice. And that, that's an important uh, element to raise. Uh, so that I'm not misunderstood. I'm not trying to read my personal practice into Scripture. Be and I, that's why I say, if I read in Isaiah 1, he condemns them for watering down their wine, then obviously the crime in Isaiah 1 is weak wine and should be strong, intended to be strong and for a purpose. And uh, that, that's important. Uh, important to have the right doctrine there. Uh, so there's two as aspects. Is it legitimate at all to have alcohol? I say absolutely yes. Is it uh, required that only alcohol be served in a uh, or only grape juice be served? I, I uh, stand on the line between those two positions. I believe in Christian liberty and charity, and that means both options are available. So that neither brother is uh, essentially excommunicated by the way the Lord's table is configured. Hope that helps. Any other questions? Uh, here we go. Cheer. Uh, thank you, Brian. Do you think communion should be reserved for worship services? <laughs> well, there would be uh, Presbyterian Elder Martin saying one thing and the uh, theologian Martin making a prediction about what might be happening in the future. So uh, it, it's an interesting question because uh, the fencing of the table generally presupposes the presence of church officers to ensure that that is taking place. The question is, are the yeah, are they the proper venue for making that ruling, or is the father to be trusted in the family? And again, this ties us out with, to what extent is the Old Testament um, Passover meal coordinated or correlated with the communion supper in the New Testament? Uh, and for those who see a very weak connection, they will answer that it should always be reserved for the worship services, and that elders uh, and qualified ordained individuals should be serving and overlooking that process by which communion is administered. If you see a much tighter connection between Passover and the communion, then you're more likely to see the father of the household uh, as the person who actually would be offering that, even in a church setting. He would go up, say, and uh, collect the elements and bring them back to the family. I've seen this in many very faithful Presbyterian-style churches, Reformed churches, and I've seen the other way. So there's a lot of different modes by which uh, communion is served. Apparently, the most controversial is to make it a complete meal in itself, which ironically would be the end game uh, of uh, and the extreme form of saying yes, uh, Passover meal and the Lord's Supper are pretty much one of the same thing. One is the New Testament fulfillment of the other, and this comes a little bit closer to the love feast concept laid out in Jude. We kind of have that kind of hangs out there as some kind of um, addendum, an appendix that nobody knows what to do with as if it was something we can dispense with. But perhaps a love feast that, uh, and the blemishes on love feasts that uh, is referred to by Jude is referring to the Lord's Supper. After all, folks are jumping all over the Lord's Supper, even in First Corinthians, because they're hungry. So it sounds like it's a full-size meal. But right now we have this uh, extremely abstracted structure with a very teeny piece of a wafer and a little thimbleful of uh, grape juice and or wine. And uh, that may not necessarily answer to what is in Scripture, though it's certainly easier to, to, to provide that. So those, these things are yet to be uh, resolved, which means to me that there's a lot of posturing in Christendom that is not given over to peace between brothers, but rather warfare. And uh, I think we better be careful which hills we want to die on. Uh, the, the culture is going to continue to sink if that's what we're going to fight over. 
yeah, if those who say get worship right and everything else will straighten out, good luck with that. I don't see that that, that I think you have to have a, a, a fully orbed orthodoxy that addresses all matters of life and living, a faith for all of life, and it should not be just a faith for all of church. All right. Yes, Kevin, you're welcome. I hope that was a helpful answer. It, it might not be what you might have expected, but that's that's how we uh, I would approach that question about communion and grape juice versus wine versus both. Looks like we have a, a lull in the action here. Uh, while we're having a lull, I'll let you know a little bit about the group in Australia that I worked with, the Daniel 244 conference. Uh, these folks are dyed in the wool uh, creationists, and that was it was fascinating to listen to their discussions. They are well um, learned on these topics. They went into great detail uh, in the sciences in particular. And it was very heartening to realize that this was a non-negotiable with these men. So are they st so once they get Genesis right, a lot of other things fall into place uh, as a result. So they had, uh, it was a very warm reception, and I was able to put across, um, it ended up being nine lectures, actually one long Q&A session or an interview with me, and then eight separate topics, and it was going well. Uh, Nancy Book asked, how is the Kishore Project going? Well, I am in the process of uh, finishing the 18th and last article on that, and then the film is still moving forward. There are some funding potentials for the film that uh, we are waiting upon uh, to get us over the hump, and uh, there's also at least two books in the work, mine and a book by Dr. Michael Gendry. Uh, each book has a separate function to play in telling the story. Uh, but they both have, because there's so much to cover. It's like we would need four Gospels to cover Christ. Apparently we need two books to cover Dr. Kishore's story with any pretense to completeness. So I, I enjoy that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Kevin, it's good to know that, uh, and at least have respect for other people's views. When I, Even when I listen to a position that I disagree with, I want to understand the reasoning behind it. And I can see where he, uh, that individual may have arrived at his conclusions related to the, the topic at hand. How, why did he resolve the question one way instead of the other? By the way, uh, on that topic, uh, this is interesting, on that topic of um, grape juice versus wine, did you know that the, in, there's some kind of equivalence in them in scriptures you can't escape because the Nazarite wasn't even supposed to let uh, eat a grape. <laughs> so from one point of view, uh, grape juice may not be, uh, uh, or at least was treated as equivalent, and it didn't matter how fresh it was. So again, if you look at all the scriptural data, the, the picture starts to become more interesting, more involved, not as cut and dry as at first glance, that, well, there's wine, and then there's grape juice. Well, the scripture, from one point of view, uh, treated them identically, and now what? <laughs> so we have a, we have another mess once we look at the whole idea. Why is it the Nazarite wasn't even allowed to um, partake of certain things before it even became wine? The Chalcedon Foundation. I know these people. Could you elaborate how you think it will fit into the news about opioids that is coming from the federal government? I don't think what the Kishore story has to say will fit into the news. In fact, it's a it's. It's because the Kishore solution is not being allowed to fit. It's being uh, crowded out with the state's solution, which always involves methadone and suboxone. One of the things we're going to bring up, unfortunately, in the course of this 18th article, is the fact that Dr. Kishore did not name his program after himself. He named it the Massachusetts Model, which is the state where he first entered and became uh, a, an addiction pioneer. And he named it after the state instead of himself. After he was, and, and of course, now he, this model, the Massachusetts model, has this tremendous track record of a quarter million people gone through with it, uh, and of all those who were uh, in it, during the time he, they were treated by him, not a single person died. So it had a perfect track record until it was uh, shut down in September 2011. Now, what has happened is because there was no copyright or trademark or register mark on the Massachusetts model. So a Suboxone-oriented group has now appropriated that model and called themselves the Massachusetts model. We're using the Massachusetts model. So they ride the coattails of Dr. Kishore and are now using the name of his model when it's anything but, because his was non-narcotic. 
And then now you say, this is the Massachusetts model. People think, well, that must be the model that was so successful and no one died on it. And instead, they go to this place and they and this system, and they get what they think is the Massachusetts model of Kishores, but it's simply a name that's been hijacked. Uh, and boom, you're getting Suboxone or Methadone. The gold standards, as they're called, which they're not, they're lead standards, as I point out, and their lead parachutes will le lead you to the grave very quickly. So, uh, what is happening, of course, is that there is a ton of circling of the wagons to try to say if we throw more money at it and more Suboxone and Methadone, the MAT, the medically assisted treatments, uh, which are not, not which are narcotic based, in other words, hair of the dog solutions, we go back to the same problem. So, a Christian rethinking, a Christian reconstruction of the entire treatment process for opioids is still off the table. So we're gonna w when these this film hits, it'll basically uh, be like a, a baseball bat to the head for the uh, the established uh, medical processes because they believe they've uh, shut it down pretty completely. So for this thing to rear its head again, uh, it's going to be a shocker uh, to the powers that be those who control and have the reins of modern medical practice as it relates to addiction treatment. So that would be my initial elaboration on this. Uh, their paradigm does not include anything other than methadone and suboxone and things like it. And so a non-narcotic guy who was actually able to uh, bring this many people through without any deaths while he was running. Now, of course, once they shut him down, he, they, they say, you will not practice medicine anymore, and he cut all these folks free from the method that was cleaning cleaning them up and getting their lives back to, get to them, then the uh, death toll started to mount. And that's a direct result of state action. And this appears very vividly and emotionally in the motion pictures. One of the most gripping parts of the film, uh, as those who saw a, um, the preview of it in Pennsylvania noticed, uh, was when uh, some of the people who were working with uh, and knew those who had passed away were called to comment on the price that was paid by shutting down these clinics that were running without narcotics and actually bringing people's lives back. Let's see, any other questions pending? Nope. It's a quiet Sunday today. And I don't think the hurricane is to blame for that. So, but we are back in the saddle. That's the good news. I think this is our 10th Q&A, so uh, it's a, a landmark for us to have gone this far. Hope there's some uh, blessing to everyone in it. What is your view on psalms only to be sung in church service? I actually spoke to this a question when I was in Pennsylvania since I spoke about the Christian reconstruction of music. I think the big problem with psalms only to be sung is in Psalm 119, verse 54. Here's a railroaded verse if ever there was one. It is just um, egregiously mangled by uh, the exclusive psalm it is. Yeah, and I have Girardot and other folks on my shelf, it's, and so but it's not as if I'm not aware of the reasoning, and these men are certainly men who work very, very hard to try to justify uh, what they believe is correct. So n no blame on their heart in the matter, but the conducting the handling of Scripture can be looked at with a critical eye. So here's the problem. The 54th verse, uh, the entire verse really, when I think about it, Thy statutes have been my songs in the days of my pilgrimage. That's what David says. He, and, and as William uh, pointed out, he says the Hebrews versified the laws of God, 613 laws of God, and sang them so that the children could memorize them. So everyone knew them. No one, there was no such thing as ignorance of the law of God because they were the songs of Israel. So the turning of the songs, the laws of God, into songs was David's practice. And he says so. That, uh, the, his, that the statutes of God were his songs in his days of his pilgrimage. Uh, for, and so how does, how does the exclusive psalmist get away with that? And they say, well, statutes actually refers to the psalms. So this massive tautology is suddenly generated, which makes the verse have, make no sense whatsoever. By the way, every other verse in Psalm 119 is a, um, uh, a commendation, a, a glorious encomium, on the law of God, the statutes, the precepts, the testimonies, the laws, the commandments of God, um, precepts, they're all uh, the source of blessing. And so every single, we have 176 verses about the law of God, except apparently verse 54, because Psalm, exclusive psalmist says we have to uh, reroute that verse and fix it, because that verse, as it stands, prima facie, says that David sang the laws of God. And if he sang the laws of God, then exclusive psalmody 
has already been disrupted from inside itself, inside the longest psalm, which says the laws of God can also be sung. In fact, were to be versified and sung. So that was David's practice. And we have a fundamental question anyway about is this a mosaic practice or not? You see, the problem is that the tabernacle, tabernacle of David is very different from mosaic. The uh, courses of the musicians that were set up, say, in First Chronicles 25, you know, uh, especially verse 8 and following, 6-3, all these passages in First Chronicles 25, uh, we show that this, this is David's hand, handiwork. And so the setting up back again of the tabernacle of David would be the restoration of Davidic worship, and it would have very little to do with Moses. So the way that exclusive psalmody gets off the ground is to say, you know, especially with instruments and things of this order, is boom, uh, those are mosaic practices, and when the mosaic system uh, was set aside, uh, those, in, those shadows and, and uh, weak beggarly elements are set aside, the instruments went with it, and anything other than psalms or singing was, was, went with that. But if, in fact, the scripture points out that that was not mosaic, but rather it was, in fact, Davidic, then we have a whole different discussion, because that was added afterward. And, in fact, the raising up again of the tabernacle of David, which is predicted in Amos 9.11, comes back to play in Acts 15 and elsewhere. So, uh, I do not believe that you can uh, seriously argue for exclusive psalmody without doing tremendous violence to Psalm 119, verse 54. You almost have to scratch it out of your scriptures because to make statutes, you know, the psalm about statutes to mean something other than statutes is doesn't make sense. So you have to decide, is my dogma more important than the scripture, or does the scripture rule the dogma? And and so the word of God cannot be broken. And, and, and I think Jesus made it clear, scripture cannot be broken, therefore we have to bend to the scripture. We don't master the scripture, the scripture masters us, we always say. Okay, I think, uh, make sure nothing happened after Justin asked that question. Andrea uh, writes, You have brought to our attention the need for charity in dealing with brothers in Christ on views we have on issues like psalmody, communion, etc. Do you think we should extend the same to those of uh, believers who give? And I don't see the rest. <laughs> Just typical of this system. Um, and, Andrea will probably get me the rest of it. So what she's probably going to get at once I see the rest of it is what are, what are the boundaries of charity versus where we have to draw a line in the sand? That would be my guess is where she's driving at. At what point do we see you extend the same to those believers who give their children over to statist education? Oh, my. Uh, this is not a doctrinal matter anymore, is it? Because the children are the heritage of the Lord, and I think for... You know, I am not as strong on this as pres in terms of presentation as, say, Dr. Bruce Short would be, uh, because when the question was posed to him, he says, uh, uh, how did he phrase it? It was pretty, it's, well, it, it boiled down to said that when he was asked to draw a comparison, you know, is it a sin, you guys like to post, is it a sin for a Christian to have his children in public schools, and he gave us some moments of thought and says, no, it's, it's, it's not. It, it's, it's a damnable sin, and, and you should go to hell for it. So here's Dr. Short's position, because he sees the tremendous damage that the public schools are doing to your children, deliberately so, and uh, to close our eyes to that, uh, and see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, uh, is culpable in his view. We publish his book, because no one else would publish such a strong book as The Harsh Truth by public uh, schools, because he saw them for what they're really doing. By the way, the book, uh, which was published in 2008-ish, 2004, somewhere in that time frame, uh, ended up soft peddling things in actual light of where we are today. Uh, he ended up not seeing how quickly things would deteriorate in some respects. It's gotten much worse than the book indicates. So. Uh, can there be fellowship? Yes, but I think that fellowship should be marked with continual prophetic um, denunciation of public schools. You don't have to necessarily denounce the man, but denounce the doctrine and that leads someone to think it's okay. Because if we um, wink at sin, uh, people will, will sin. <laughs> They'll say, okay, it's okay. In fact, this is the whole premise of this verse, the 
that shapes and frames the second greatest commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. If we look back at Leviticus 19, it's interesting the context for that passage. Let me get it exactly the way it's written here in the King James. Okay, it starts with verse 17 to 18. Here's your context. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Do not let sin be on his head. You, in other words, in this context, you will not hate him. You will rebuke him. Hatred is refusal to rebuke, to keep mum and quiet. That is represents hatred. And then the verse says, Thou shalt not hate, you know, Thou shalt uh, not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So the love of neighbor entails from the previous verse the willingness to rebuke them when sin is on their head. If you fail to rebuke them, their sin is on your head. So you have an obligation to continually warn against the consequences of having their children in public schools. Uh, it, it does not need to be nagging. It doesn't need to be every single week, but it needs to be there so that they know exactly where you stand and why you stand. It cannot just be an arbitrary, they're bad. You have to, um, and you must all offer an alternative. It's not enough to say, I can, uh, you shouldn't have them in public school. It says, I can help you homeschool. I will help you put together a package to get your kids out of there. Give the right hand of support to it. Make it not so difficult and forbidding for them to go. Andre Schwartz's books go a long ways toward making it uh, more feasible for people to consider the option. Regrettably, what happens in too many churches is the homeschooling parents are singled out by the pastor for, you know, you need to get your kids in public school where they can do all the necessary missionary work that your uh, brothers here are doing with their kids. <laughs> and, this, and, and so there's pressure applied to comply and to go with the flow and be part of the crowd. Yet we're told, thou shalt not follow in multitude to do evil. So we need to apply pressure, in other words, rebuke. We shall, and, but the rebuke does not need to be a continual dripping. It needs to be just forthright, honest, fully informed and biblical. And that will have its most effect. If you can come up with scriptures that underscore the position, go with that. Because the scripture can speak louder than your arguments and your complaints are going to speak. Always, because you may not seem that way, but Jesus made it very clear. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They're not just vibrations in the air. They have an impact. So laying a scriptural foundation, to, sometimes it takes a little while for people to break away from the state system. Not everyone snaps instantly to attention and says, Oh, right, what am I doing putting my kids in public school? It might be that it takes some pressure. And if I say, you know, I fought you on that, and I didn't see it until event A, B, or C, or I fell under conviction. I saw what was happening with someone else and said, I don't want that to happen to me or my kids. Or someone gave me a, a way to do it, a way to pull off Christian schooling. Uh, someone provided a scholarship to get my kids into a Christian school. Or I became part of a homeschooling group. Uh, but until the pastors move on in terms of this and make it a priority, uh, it's going to end up being lay people talking to one another and, in essence, rebuking uh, those who have their children. And rebuke does not have to be a harsh word. Uh, remember, the soft answer always turns away wrath. Uh, so it's important to to, to work uh, and do our rebuking the way that Paul describes. There needs to be a gentle Christ-like spirit. Your children are in danger, and I want to see what I can do to, to help you take them out of danger. What can I do to, to, to move in terms of, of your children's actual needs uh, in Christ? And if you start couching it in a way that is winsome, as they say, people are more inclined to listen rather than saying, you know, shame on you. you know, it might come to a shame on you ultimately, but you don't start there. You start there by trying to reach them. Okay. Kevin asks another question. Can you speak to your perspective of the wide and narrow path that you mentioned in your article of reconstructing postmillennialism? This has really to do with what does it mean when uh, the gates of hell shall not uh, prevail against the, uh, the Church of Christ? That famous prosaic statement, as Bittner put it, Lorraine Bettner. Uh, from Matthew 16, 18. And it's because uh, we're sitting there in the middle of Matthew that we wanted to discuss, what is this issue? Has Jesus already discussed this question of uh, gates? And, and he has. You know, there's, uh, it's already been discussed in Matthew 7. 
And so I believe he's simply coming back to the same idea about the narrow path that leads to life uh, and the wide path that leads to destruction, to hell, in essence, to, to perdition. And what's going to happen over time is that more and more of the mankind are going to end up on the narrow path, and the wide path of destruction ends up suddenly becoming unpeopled toward the end, fewer and fewer until nothing. Hell's food supply is choked off, is the way I put it. And in that way, the gates of hell, which is the entryway to hell, they, they don't prevail. They are defeated completely. They don't serve as, uh, as an entryway for any more souls. Uh, the last soul that went into hell has already gone into it, and that's the last victory that Satan has. In the meantime, the path that leads to life, all nations are walking in that way. And this is how the victory of Christ actually is embodied through the preaching of the gospel. It's a tremendous victory, and it's done not through might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God, driving everyone onto that one path, the one that everyone eschewed. Because at the time Jesus spoke, he says, few are they now that find it in the first century. Many are those on the other path. To this day, there's still many on the other path, but there are many on the path that leads to life and have been. And it's going to continue to grow in the same way that that little trickle out of the side of the temple in Ezekiel 30, 47 grew into you know the brook ankle high, the stream knee high, and then finally a river loins high, and then finally a, t a torrent that no man could pass. And it all pours into the Dead Sea and brings it, everything in there back to life that was dead before it. And that's what's actually going on. So, yeah, that's the whole idea is that the gate doctrine of uh, Matthew 7, I think, properly applies over here in Matthew 16. Uh, otherwise, we are introducing a brand new concept of gate. It can be one of two ways. Postmillennial, you would say, uh, the gates are defensive weapons, so obviously the church is pounding on the gates of hell uh, and uh, succeeding. But, you know, hell is actually a place where souls, that, that, that disembodied souls go to. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure quite how the church today is deliberately pounding against the gates of hell. And by the same token, uh, the premillennialists and the defeatist eschatologies simply say, you know, we are cowering and the gates of hell are pounding us and we just we managed to survive and just barely hunker through. So they have a defeatist approach to it, but um, and they don't and they regard a gate as an offensive weapon, which it's not. But it's not even a weapon at all. The gate is an entry point, and that's it's an entry point as described by Jesus already in Matthew seven. So my approach to it is to take gate in Matthew sixteen to mean the same idea as gate in Matthew seven. And one reason that makes sense is because gates that lead to destruction is part of the Matthew seven discussion of gates. And the gate to hell is a gate to destruction over here. So to make it mean something new uh, is, is a different. Now, admittedly, that's a compounded verb uh, when that's being used there, which suggests we should at least take it seriously, you know, shall not prevail, that word prevail. Um, but nonetheless, I think the key feature to tie the two passages together is the concept of gates, and a gate that leads to destruction is coordinated to a gate to hell. And that is why I take those passages the way that I do, I see a connection there that means we don't have to uh, cast a, a wide net to try to figure out what the gates of hell are if he's already covered the ground in Matthew 7. All right. And I think, do we have any other questions pending? And if we have a really uncomfortable long silence, we're going to shut things down. There's nothing worse than dead air, don't you think? Especially on Facebook, when a lot of people will come in and visit this uh, live broadcast and they see me, my face, doing nothing for five or ten seconds. That's how they're going to remember these broadcasts, for better or worse. Ah, Nancy Wilkass. We have opportunity to teach an overview of the... I can't see the rest of it because it's pinned. Maybe it'll come up. Come on. Oh, you go. Uh, to the overview of the Ten Commandments, an introduction to a biblical worldview with its social constructs targeting parents. What would you say are the essential elements of this type of study? I don't like to um, reduce it to individual elements. I think what I like to promote is totalism. Now, totalism is a pejorative term. If you go to the, uh, the abuse websites, they believe totalism means some kind of mind control. Uh, and it's every single aspect of your life is locked into some kind of a robotic thing. And uh, biblical totalism means something very, very different than that. So, uh, unfortunately, that's a hijacked term, and there's not a lot we can do about it. 
So perhaps we should come up with a better way of saying the, the fully orbed orthodoxy. And so I want to talk about the extensiveness of the kingdom of God and the claims of the law of God, um, that it covers all of life. And uh, so I start with several premises. I start with the teaching, I think it's in Psalm 119, verse 96 or 99. Uh, I've seen an end to all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad, which is to say the commandments of God cover everything exceedingly broad. So we want to notice that God has not left anything uh, that needed to be said to us unsaid. So the sufficiency of Scripture is important, and to say the sufficiency of the law of God is the key. It puts all the principles in place by which we can reason biblically and reason uh, with justice and righteousness into all areas. So that's that would be element one. The second point that this becomes important is in Proverbs 21.4, where uh, you know a, a high look, a proud heart, and even the plowing of the wicked is sin. That's the second half of that Proverbs 21.4. If so, that means that even neutral things like plowing can be sinful. When I spoke in uh, Wyoming, Pennsylvania, back in July, I said, "Now, if it's possible to plow wickedly, does the Scripture give us instructions how to plow righteously?" And the answer is yes. It's right there in the uh, 28th chapter of Isaiah. I think it's verses 23 to 29, uh, or approximately, where he says, "This is." how to plow, and God instructs the plowman how to do it, and shows about the right tools, the right timing, um, the right methods, and, and so you see the wisdom of God being laid out here. So it's important to me that folks realize that there's not one element of human uh, action which is not subject to the noetic effects of sin, the effects of sin on the mind, and that that sinfulness, our rebellion against God, can be implemented in the work of our hand. And therefore, we need to bend everything straight again. You know, Christ makes all things straight. All every crooked way, he makes straight again. It's in Psalm 119, verse 128, in the literal Hebrew. I have a version of this in the uh, Chalcedon, the Faith for All of Life mag uh, magazine. It's, the issue is um, called, Does Theonomy Have a Fatal Flaw? And in that article, I do an exposition of that passage from the original Hebrew, showing how that works out. So... Uh, yeah, you're going to you're talking about the social constructs and things, but you want to point out that all these things are subject to being um, torn down because whatsoever thing the Lord hath not planted shall be rooted up, Matthew fifteen thirteen, and so you want to be on the solid ground. You don't want to be on the sand. And you're going to be toppled by the storms of life, uh, and these are all important elements that we have to uh, capture uh, for Christ. So the totality of Scripture and its application across all domains must be. Uh, sure, it's not just some social structures or social constructs that need, can be addressed. It's all of them. And there's nothing that is not subject to further reconstruction. There's, we have not all arrived, and nor have all the things under our hand have been properly delivered back up to God. The only one who can make that claim completely is Christ when he delivers up the kingdom to the Father. He can perfect what we cannot. And so he makes up lack for it, not only in our prayers, but even in our actions, and that's important to recognize. Uh, if our heart is right, then a lot of things can be uh, structured by God to serve his purposes. But if we believe it's legitimate to operate outside the domain of Scripture and his law, uh, we're going to be in big trouble because we're going to be uh, sowing in the wind. It'll be a vanity. Thank you for putting that up there. That, that article does describe how Christ came to make all the crooked paths straight. And that's an important aspect of his work and our work in him. And so that's what we do. When you confront all these social constructs, as Nancy put in the original question, uh, I think it's always important to say it's not just uh, this pointillistic aspect, this thing, this, this thing. It's a broad, broad area. All domains come under, fall under the uh, dominion of Christ. He, he is king over all. In every sphere, every crown has to be flung at his feet. And that's important to, uh, because... Um, modern man is very adept at hiding from God in these very elaborate abstract structures that uh, university uh, ivory towers construct routinely. Uh, they are idols of the mind, as Herbert Schlossberg puts it in his excellent book, Idols for Destruction. If you don't have a copy, get a copy. Share copies. Make it a project for your people. It's one of the uh, non-Chalcedon books that I think is an absolute must-read uh, because it shapes and, and frames the whole debate of why our culture is the way it is. And uh, you can be certain 
Dr. Schlossberg was very much familiar with Rushdoni's uh, work, in fact quoted from it in the course of the book. Yep, indeed. Thank you. There's a, a reference down there that we do look for uh, questions to be asked in advance because I'm certainly in a position to capture them and get caught up with them at the beginning of these Q&A sessions and uh, move forward. I see Jeff Durbin has joined us, so it's uh, good to have a fellow warrior in, in the mix here. And uh, certainly someone who's just as, uh, actually he's, he's done some interesting work, I think, to see if it's possible to, to uh, reconstruct the notion of a late night talk show. So for folks who want to see if it's in fact doable, let's check out what, uh, what he's been doing over there with Apologia. Interesting stuff. Hey, brother. Good to hear from you, too. And by the way, the one thing that separates Jeff and me big time is this thing here. You're not lucky to see one of these on him, and you're almost always certain to see them on me. But if that's the only thing dividing us, that's not so bad, is it, brother? <laughs> okay, any other questions at this point in time? As I said, if we have too many strained uh, silences, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and uh, and close up for the day, um, you know, because we do answer a whole lot of technical questions. And as you saw at the very beginning, we got rather deep into the uh, Hebrew of Isaiah 66:23 because it has a bearing uh, on the uh, understanding of that verse. It's interesting how multi-layered a Facebook live event can be because there can be conversations going on between uh, attendees while I'm off here piping away on who knows what I'm chewing on sometimes, but usually something scriptural. And if anyone was curable, yeah, we did. Do you want me to talk about that, Jeff, the parable of the wheat and tares? We've done it, uh, I think, three times already in the course of these ten Q&As, but I never seem to get tired of it. And I did bring it up when I spoke in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. I'll go ahead and do that, sure. So the parable of the wheat and tares, what we fail to notice is that there's what's called a protensive element to the prophecy. Basically, the prophecy sees the world through time as well as in space. Not only just extension, but protension and time from beginning to end. And when you see it protensively, and that's important because it's this protensive element occurs elsewhere, in Scripture, uh, not only in this particular uh, parable, by the way, we see the protensive element uh, with the leaven. Over time, it leavens the whole lump until there's, at last, all is leavened with omission of no part. That's the sense of that particular word in the Greek. And the mustard seed, we see a beginning and to an end. And so this notion of a protensive progression also is incipient in the passage of the wheat and tare parable. And Here's a parable where we have the advantage where an explanation is given. And we need to take the explanation literally. I think this is where a lot of people fall apart and where we end up with amillennial notions of thrusting at the beginning, saying, okay, just figure that is always a static view through all time. But that's imposed on the vision, and it throws away the explanation why the angels are blocked from pulling any tares. The explanation is you will pull out wheat if you do so. We've seen all sorts of oddball explanations for this to the intent that, well, you know, the, the roots are maybe tied together, and if you pull out a, a tear, uh, a wheat's going to get yanked out accidentally. I have to tell you something. Read everything about angels uh, going on the attack and taking out people. They're pretty good at it. They are the so-called precision strike guys. You know, if there's no blood on the lintel of doorpost, that firstborn's going down. There's a whole passage in Ezekiel that talk about you know, if they're marked for protection or not, a seal of protection. Anyone not was marked, boom. So uh, they can take out a Hitler without hurting anyone else around Hitler. It is an easy thing to do. So what is actually at stake here? It is this. Take the example of Abraham. Abraham had a pagan father named Tira. So let's assume the angels say, let's take out Tira. He's a tear, and he is. But guess what? Abraham's not born. We've destroyed in because Abraham was present in the loins of Tira. This argument is raised in Hebrews 7, right? Looky, looky. Uh, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. Well, he wasn't born yet. Nobody paid tithes while in the loins of Abraham when that event occurred over there in Genesis 14. So there is a sense in which people are present uh, and yet not yet born. Look at Psalm 22. 
He shall proclaim he, it is finished to a people not yet born. See, there's this concept of protension through time. So the reason you don't, one of the reasons you don't destroy a tear is it may have, and is likely to have, elect offspring. There are wheat to come that you would be destroying by taking out the tear. You know, almost most of us have the situation where we can point to an ancestor of ours that was a tear and not a wheat. In which case, had the angels decided, let's go clean the house on the tares, we wouldn't be here. So if you run this process over time, you get a very interesting effect. And there's a second process going on through time. And this is a covenantal promise of God laid out in Psalm 37 and Psalm 109, where God is essentially uh, cutting off the posterity of the wicked. And in the generation to come, their name is blotted out. This, I think, is the 14th verse of Psalm 109. So there's a process by which the wicked will not have their posterity even to... Uh, come be birthed, as it were. There's a natural dead end, if you will, in uh, same-sex marriages. They're not going to have children. They have to adopt them from some other source, which is fertile. Uh, and therefore, they have to steal, if you will, um, to have posterity. They can't, don't have it intrinsically. So here's two different phenomena that are operating through time. You have uh, the posterity of the wicked being cut off and their name in the next generation being blotted out. And you have tares giving birth to Christians. And you run this through time, and boom, at the end, if you run this as an algorithm on a computer, it'll finally just tell you, by the way, at the end of this thing running, there will be nothing but wheat at the end. So if you were to look at the um, the field as the world, most people say it's just, it's, it's intermixed tares and wheat. But it really is, it's a diagonal cut. And the diagonal that's getting smaller through time is the, is the uh, tares. And the diagonal part that's getting wider through time, as you go up, there's a more and more and more and more, more this is the wider triangle here. That's the wheat. So yeah, they're both present, but looked at only in a single moment of time. Remember, God sees all of time at once. What to us is a stream flowing past us is an ocean at one glance to God. So, because it exists by his one single decree. So that's the issue. In the parable of the wheat and tares, we take seriously the reason that the angels are blocked and barred by direct command of God, do not take out the tares. You will pull out wheat. And why? Because the tares will have wheat offspring. And also, the tares that may not have wheat offspring, their posterity will be cut off. Uh, you run this process like you run any process like the leaven leavening the lump and a mustard seed being left in the sun and the rain, it'll grow. And so what happens is that ultimately there are no tares left. <laughs> See if there's anything left here. Thanks to everyone. I guess we're at the end. All right, appreciate all the, uh, the great questions. We'll see you next week. Yeah, I don't foresee any more trips on the other side of the equator for any length of time. And uh, But thank you for your prayers for my having been able to be there and minister and to bring the Word of God to people who are very anxious to hear how to apply their faith across the board. Thank you too, Jeff. Keep good, uh, continue your good work. We'll be about lifting up uh, your missions and your uh, labors before the Lord too. You see, in um, Nehemiah 4, it says, The work is very great and large, and we are few and far apart along the wall. That's our situation as Reconstructionists. Nonetheless, the work goes up, and the whole wall goes up all over the place, even on the other side of the equator, where I bear, bear witness to it. So to that end, let's continue to labor, sword in one hand, trowel in the other, and uh, the wall will go up. And then to God be the glory. Amen. See you guys next week.